Here's a very cool pattern making system. It's vintage from the early 1970s and it's called the Dot Pattern Deluxe System. Of course, the clothes are not exactly modern and I wanted to make a loose raglan with a fairly deep armhole. So here's how I chose to do it. We'll look at the basic method for utilizing the system and also look at how to update the style. In my opinion, one of the very nicest features about this system is the ruler. These two function in about the same way, but in the low low system, a person sticks the pin through the number or the hole next to the number that is closest to their size in centimeters. Everyone on the dot pattern sticks the pin through that hole but adjust the scale. These refer to centimeter sizes also and the range is not as large. It goes from 82 to 140, which covers the huge majority of women and quite a lot of children, but it doesn't go down to dolls. It also works for men. So we'll take somebody with a 106 bust adjust for her, tighten down that thumb screw, and there we are. And here's the other end of the tape. This is a sturdy, I would call it a plasticized cloth tape, so it'll hold up well. And of course the steel holds up very well. First take a look at the measuring instructions. It's not as obvious in this picture, but it is in the text. The tape is brought up over the back muscles and then across the bust. So you're getting two areas in which the body flares. Ditto in the hip area, which they make much more obvious in the diagram. So the measurement that we're working with will already include enough ease to go around wherever the wearer happens to be biggest. It also produces a number that is going to embarrass you, at least if you're, like most of us in America, very concerned about these measurements and accustomed to thinking about what's acceptable and what's not. So you need to brace yourself to get over that because we're really talking about clothes sizes to fit comfortably over the body. These are not the measurements that you would give the Miss America contest if you were running. But because of measuring this in this manner, you don't get that business of a garment that basically fits but hikes up and wrinkles over an area where you're a little fuller. I actually dislike this robe, but it's the closest pattern to what I wanted, and here's why. This is the sleeve. Notice that it's a raglan sleeve. You can see that because of the seam that goes diagonally rather than being shaped like this. But it's in two pieces, or I actually cut it in one piece because it's okay to ignore that separation and do so if the fabric is wide enough. So this functions as a big, big dart, which falls here on the body and narrows the area where the sleeve had to widen to go around the shoulder so that it's not wide and gapy here. That's a problem with a simpler style of raglan especially on a woman who is full in the bust or muscular in the chest, back, and shoulder areas. She needs room in the bust and room in the shoulders, but it needs to taper in quite dramatically from there to the neck area so as to avoid gaping. This two-piece raglan design allows more places in which the tapering can occur, so it is much better at making a good fit around both the neck the bust and the shoulders. Here's another reason that I particularly wanted to work with this pattern and thought it might offer a superior fit. Note the shape of the front and the back sleeve and armholes in this curve. In more basic raglan shapes, sometimes those are almost identical. In this case, they're not at all, and it'll become more noticeable on the larger human-sized project. These arrows on this system and on many similar systems 
indicate the straight of grain. And you can see that I fudged since I just called this the center. Neither piece was perfectly on the straight of grain, but no harm was done to the design. On every pattern in the dot system, that little cross there, 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 is where you put your pin through the hole in this and into the paper that you're tracing the pattern onto. You need a very sharp, very slender push pin and you need some padding underneath it in order to trace effectively. The, you have to allow the push pin to push in in order to stay and pivot this tool. Um, so a, a traditional cutting board cover to your table is an excellent thing. Even when flared sleeves are in style, I'm not a fan. I just can't manage them. I catch them on everything. So this is absolutely wrong for me. And I also didn't want it full length. I wanted it elbow length. But things like that are easily redrawable. After you make the basic pattern, you just measure either yourself or a top that fits you where you want it to and apply the length and width measurements and draw the taper in. No problem. Here's the garment front. Another issue. We need to get rid of the area that's being indicated here as the overlap that buttons because I didn't want any buttons. It's a pullover. That's how they intended it to come out. We're totally not going to use the collar. But if we use this as the center front line of the pattern and place it on the fold, there's no problem. What I chose to do about the neckline is, I think, a good approach and works for me every time, but you have to be brave. I went ahead and designed or traced the pattern as shown so as to get the proper shape all the way around. Then trimmed the neckline by hand and added the band later once I saw how it was going to fall. The flare can be adjusted again by measuring the hip area of a garment that you do enjoy starting here and making less flare or if necessary more flare. It's unlikely that you would want more flare than the robe on a top but sometimes you're starting with something completely different from this. So just, you can see these are straight lines. You can alter a straight line in a pattern without any great worry as long as you allow yourself booty room. Here's the cross that we are going to use as our pivot point. And here's another good feature of this design that made me think it would work. There is a dart at the neckline. So it's again providing plenty of room in the chest and other upper back for a busty woman to have plenty of movement room and narrowing that at the neckline because she's not necessarily big everywhere, just needing some room. It doesn't look a great deal different than a more simply constructed raglan where this line just went straight, but it feels in wear quite a bit different. You don't feel as restricted in movement. So that's a quick overview of the changes that I made in order to make this tunic come out modern looking. Here are the actual pattern pieces I created. It's a good idea to mark the number that the book assigns to the design on your piece. This is the front piece where I created it as shown and then folded it to get rid of the overlap for the front closure. Drew in the dart as you see at the left. This is the sleeve piece created for the first blouse of its kind by leaving this straight. I cut it straight, then tapered it and fitted it on the wearer. I'll make notes and go ahead and amend the pattern for future use. Note that the line that you create when tracing does not include seam allowance. I didn't add it in on these patterns and I normally don't. I cut it by eye based on whether I'm going to assemble on the serger or the sewing machine and who I'm working for. But another perfectly acceptable thing to do is add your seam allowance before you trim the pattern out. Now we'll trace the sleeve together. 
All the pieces work in the same way. The sleeve might be the easiest one for me to show you because of its limited length. It's very hard to get a camera position where you can see and I can work. There's the pin going through the hole. The pattern is taped to my white paper. If you don't want to tape, it's perfectly okay to take your original and copy it as long as it's only for your own use. It would be a breach of copyright to share them around. However, not all printers and copiers automatically produce the exact size that you put in. Make sure they're set to do that. See how this rotates around? We'll trace the top half of the sleeve together. I can't arrange it so you can see me going all the way down there to trace that, but you'll get the technique from this. 82 is the very smallest size, which I've selected in order to make this easier for you to see. Very, very carefully align the side of the ruler with the line that says 52 and come up here and make a dot at the 52 point. Now without disturbing anything, rotate around till you're aligned with the 47 line and make a dot at the 47 point. You have to turn your head and get in a position to make sure that you are sighting down this accurately. You can't glance from one side because the ruler may obscure your view. 84. I'm having to stand up so that I can see it. And 84 is all the way over here at the very edge of my paper and your view. Now 85. Make sure the tape is smoothed out. This part's easy, of course, because it's inflexible. This could wiggle, so be careful. Dot at 85. 50. 85. 89. As you can see, it pays to set up your paper and check in advance. I purposely arranged that those last few would come out right at the edge or near the edge of the paper. But it does take pre-checking. That was a 65. 46. 52. And I didn't do it right. I'm off the edge of the paper. Because this is only a demo, I could just do that, but I'll show you what I do if I get this far and discover I've messed up in this. Rather than discard all my work up to this point, I get a scrap of the same paper, tape it into place, but at first with a minimum amount of tape. That is because I want to make sure that my marking will get recorded and the tape doesn't record it very well. Now I've got enough room, I'm pretty sure, to come over here. There's our 46. Now 52 reaches. Now I made a tentative mark here. I X it out because I know to ignore X's when I see them. If you're an experienced seamstress, you're already visualizing a curve here, straight line here. We know that there's this big dart and on around. If you're not, you need to learn to start doing that, seeing this series of dots connecting in your mind. Of course, you always have your little picture to refer to. And it's way more than a little picture, you now realize. I'm going to free it. Sometimes, rather than removing the tape, I checked that and it was going to mar the paper. So I just fold it on over. I feel it does less harm to the paper left in position. And although this is a new vintage system to me, I've been doing that with Loverlow pages for years and it hasn't caused any trouble.
Then now we need to connect the dots, literally, and draw the pattern. Most likely you have a tool similar to this. If not, you need one. Let's do the straight lines. As with positioning your dots, drawing these lines accurately is critical. Because you can make a small change, just the width of a dot even, and sometimes change the size and shape way more than you wanted. This will function as a dart here, but that's an awfully lot of fabric to leave in between here. So if I had not been somebody who just eyeballs their seam allowances, if I was a normal person, I would do this now so that when I cut out the fabric, it's got a seam allowance. Same here. Now I didn't measure because I'm just demonstrating. That's probably three-eighths of an inch. Most people using a sewing machine use five-eighths. Most people using a serger use a quarter. Professional dressmakers sewing for new clients often will use much, much more at the side seams and center seams where they're relatively straight because that allows us to adjust for the new client's tastes and fit after the fact. And this is where these curves are handy. Let me try to turn this better. Dot at the far left dot at the far right. Slip your curve around until it smoothly connects those dots. And had this one been way over here or way out here, I would stop and check that it had been correctly positioned. It's easy to read a number wrong or have your paper slip even though you try to secure everything. These look logical. So that will be my sewing line, and if I wanted seam allowance, I would create a cutting line. Well, you always want some seam allowance. It's how you're going to get it. Two more dots that need to be part of a deep curve down here. And I couldn't make that curve with my ruler do exactly the smooth arc I wanted. I could have looked around for my other curved rulers, or for that little bit, I trued it with my hand, just estimating. Again, a lot of this depends on how comfortable you feel with the whole process of dressmaking. These vintage books do put quite a lot of information in them. I've heard people say there are no pattern instructions, and I don't truly agree. Usually the front of the book has an entire chapter on sewing and construction. But it doesn't necessarily tell you which seams to do first. I can tell you what I would do with this one. And it doesn't mean that there's no other good way. See those three dots getting nicely connected? I'll finish drawing this and then I'll get out the diagram and show you. Now let's pretend to put a seam allowance on. Again, in real life measure, unless you are confident that your eyeballed estimate is the correct thing to do. So the dashed lines in this example are my cutting lines. Now let's just say this woman has decided to have 8 inch long sleeves starting at the underarm. I tell you what, I'm going to make it shorter. It's not too likely of a reality, but we'll call it 4 because I can mark that where you can see it better. 
four from the sewing line on this side, four from the sewing line on this side. Measure down or mark down just straight and mark across. We want to know what matrix we're working on. Find the center. This is our center line. I've determined that by measuring the whole thing and dividing it in half. Let's say this lady wants a nine inch circumference at the lower edge of the sleeve. I've got the four and a half on the center line. So zero to the center at four and a half is half of the width. Nine on this side is the whole width. And now I know where to make my sewing line and then my cutting line. Hems are not included in patterns such as this one. So we would do the same thing we did over here and then with this much of a, an angle in, we need the hem to angle out. In reality, I would measure how much the angle was, but just for demo purposes, I'm estimating. You're ready to cut it out and sew it together. At this point, you can clearly see that we have reproduced the upper part of the sleeve shape perfectly, but created a new shape from the armhole down. We were true to the original shapes of the armhole on the bodice and the sleeve, so the two will fit together. Neither one will know that we've changed the seams below. Be sure to refer to the inner cover. This is before page one. And here are all the symbols that you need to assemble and to understand what's going on with the pattern. But they won't look all that much like the ones you may be accustomed to in tissue patterns. Have a good look and it'll become clear. A lot of experienced seamstresses will find that some of this is obvious and they have no need of making some of the markings. But for newer sewers, it's a good idea to carefully read them, look at the little teeny patterns, and transfer these markings to your big patterns so you won't get confused. Years ago, when I bought my first letter low system, the saleswoman and teacher was just fantastic. And she pointed out that there are actually a limited number of ways to get fabric to wrap around the body in clothing. Only a certain number of sleeve possibilities, bodice shapes, skirt shapes, etc. really exist. The trick is to locate the elements you want in whatever patterns are available to you and apply them and bring them all together. I took her advice to heart and it has worked for me for years and years. And I think you can learn to do it too. That's what we just did together.